change is inevitable. We now appreciate that everything is mutable and undergoing change, even though much of this alteration is imperceptible. The highest mountains are slowly wearing away under our feet, while every animal and plant species on the planet is morphing into something different in ultra-slow motion. Even the eternal shining sun is fading on an astronomical schedule, though we will be long gone when it does. Human culture and biology too are part of this imperceptible slide towards something new. At the center of every significant change in our lives today is a technology of some sort. Technology is humanity's accelerant. That comes from The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly. Hello, 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 and welcome to another super special bonus episode of the Hilaritas Podcast. I am your host, Mike Gathers, and in this episode, I chat with optimist, futurist, writer, photographer, tech advocate, promoter of Slack, and the senior maverick at Wired Magazine, Kevin Kelly, about his new released book, Excellent Advice for Living, about artificial intelligence, and more. For more information and insights from Kevin and where to get his new book, check out the show notes on your app for a slew of links. Kevin is an extraordinarily curious fellow, and I find his optimistic, intelligent take on technology in the future very resonant with old Bob Wilson. Visit us at hilaritaspress.com slash podcast for more show notes, links, and past episodes. And now, my chat with Kevin Kelly. Kevin Kelly, welcome to the Hilaritas podcast. It's my privilege and honor and a delight to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Ah, it's an honor to have you. So uh, I know you as an advocate for technology, uh, particularly wired and connected tech, not necessarily wired, but connected technology, but you have a new book, which is uh, a little different. Yes, this new book is full of tiny bits of advice. I'm normally not much of an advice giver. I prefer to, uh, in our own family, raise our kids by um, demonstrating rather than saying, because I don't think kids pay much attention to what you say. They pay attention to what you do. But um, I myself found it handy to write down little things to change my own behavior. And I got in the habit of trying to condense whole books of wisdoms and lessons into a single tweet basically and um which i could then pull out and use to remind myself and i i I was collecting a number of these and i thought that you know some of this is information that i wish i'd known earlier so i could repeat it to myself earlier and so i thought well i should do the good ancestor thing and give it to my kids you know presented this advice to my kids I have three kids, and so they're adult, young adults by now. And um, I started writing them down and gifting them out, and they were hit, so I did more. And eventually I thought, you know, these are handy enough that the best way to give them would be in a, not online somewhere scattered, but in a little collection in a book. So we have a little book that's mm-hmm. called nice. Excellent Advice for Living, wisdom I wish I'd known earlier and um it's not my usual thing but I think it works yeah it's it it struck me as as a kind of book you would buy for somebody I would buy for somebody under 30 like my kids uh and then I could borrow it back and and read it myself (laughs) yeah it's sort of like hand it to someone on graduation or as a gift which is what I'm going to use it for and um they are also tweetable. So I, I know that they kind of have a nice life online and they kind of are the current vernacular, say among kids, which is that you can um, you can tell them a lot in just a one sentence. And so that attention, it works with the current attention span. Let me put it that way. 
Right. Little, you, and I know you tried to put them all in your own words, but I recognize different sources like Esther Perel or Dan Millman, maybe, or. I don't book. actually know Dan Newman. Uh, uh, he has a book, Way of the Peaceful Warrior. Uh, and and you in one of the last ones in your book is about uh, life as a series of lessons and they'll uh -huh. present themselves. Uh -huh. And so I that uh, struck me as something straight out of Dan Millman. Is that the kind of thing he says? That that was kind of one of his main themes, I think, is that, uh -huh. you know, the lesson will keep repeating itself until you learn it and then you right, can right. move on to the next one. So, yeah. so I've never read him, but I'm sure, uh -huh. as I said, you know, I heard <laughs> you just hear hear these things. I don't know where the sources are. Sure. Well, how many of these would you say? I mean, how did you gather them all? Was it through reading or your own life experience as well? A combination of both? Mostly, yeah, mostly I would. You know, the first time I sat down and I just said, what are some of the important things I know and see if I can make it into a sentence. Uh, and I did that for a couple of years in a row, just trying to dredge up from my consciousness. I think later on, I, um, I would, you know, I read widely. And of course, being at Whole Earth Catalog for many years, um improvement books self-help books were kind of part of the general do-it-yourself arena that we paid attention to so over the years i've read things and you know I, i'm sure you know as i said i don't think a lot of this is original but um there wasn't a sense of uh what's the word i want um I didn't have a program about how to collect. I didn't have a method. Okay, let me put it that way. There was no, there was no method here. The method was jot down and then try to compress something into a little bit. Jot down what I knew and believed, and then see if I could compress it. Gotcha. And and one of your um, words of wisdom uh, discussed the joy of sharing a collection. Yeah. Would you would you say this is your collection or not your a collection of yours that you're yeah. sharing? So the, the thing about sharing is, is that you can collect things or fine. But if you collect things, you need to share them. If you're just collecting them, but don't share them, then that's kind of hoarding. And that's, you know, probably not good for you. So um, so it, so if you are collecting like 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 I have collected these little um, bits of wisdom, I, I I need to share them. They're 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 otherwise I'm just hoarding them. And so um, so yeah. So if you have a tendency to want to collect really nice things to make a nice coherent collection to 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 um, include everything that's important, then it's important that you are sharing them at the same time, um, and that kind of can regulate your um, you know your ability to collect. So if you're collecting things, but just putting them away, you may want to re-examine your collection motive. Right, right. And um, another you had was right to discover what you think. Right. And I'm curious, I know these that weren't necessarily original, but I'm wondering what you might have learned about yourself through the process of creating this book. So <clears throat> this book somewhat, but mostly my other books and my other writing are my, I write books in order to find out what I think about things. So there may be people in the world who know what they think and then they have to write it down to capture it or to communicate it. But for me, it's kind of the opposite. I don't know what I think about anything until I try and write it. And for me, the writing is a process of discovering what I think about something. So I will take an assignment from Wired or whatever because I want to learn about something and I want to know what I think about it. And the only way for me to really get to what I think about it is to try and write it. So I am writing to put, to, to organize and to structure and to articulate something that I, I'm not even aware of. Mm. So in this, and so it's a, so for me, it's very, very difficult to write. I, I don't find it easy because it's a kind of thinking. So I would normally, okay, I'm going to write about, you know, image generator AIs 
Um, and so then I start to write about the first sentence or the second sentence. And I realize, wait, 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 wait. I don't really understand that. I'm trying to write it. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense to me once I say it. And so then I said, I need to go back and do some more interviews or some more reading. And then I said, now I, now I understand it. So then I, I'll finish this. I'll try to write the rest of that paragraph. And, I, and it's like, wait, wait, wait. I still don't understand this. This still doesn't make sense to me. When I'm trying to say it, it's just like, it doesn't make sense. And so then I'll have to go back again. And so there's this very long, awkward, painful process mm -hmm. of trying to write something that makes sense in order to do that i have to really understand it and it forces me to think very clearly about it so for me writing is all about clarity and if something's not clear that means that i don't not really understand it enough and so that's what writing for me is is a process of helping me understand what it is i think and believe right I usually feel going into writing, think I know what I'm talking about and then quickly discover that I, I don't know it nearly as well as I'd thought, but seems like you walk in a little more humble about the whole process than I do. Well, no, it's the same thing. I start to write thinking I, I finally understand it and now I can write it. But then two sentences in, I realize I'm still don't understand. Yeah. yeah. Gotcha. And, and I'm wondering if, how you might there's a wide range of uh topics you cover in this book and there seem to be a few themes that pop out to me like be original and become fully yourself i wonder if you could speak a little bit about the importance of that it was like a big deal yeah um you're right there's a couple of themes throughout the book one of them is recurring themes this idea of um kindness and gratitude and the other mm -hmm. one is this idea of, um, as I say, um, don't aim to be the best, aim to be the only. And I have other advice later on about, um, you know, if you're a young person and it's at all possible, try to work somewhere where there's not words or language for what it is that you're doing. You know, where we might, you have to take some time to explain it to your mother. It's sort of, it's this idea that you want to be somewhere that's a little bit more unique and um where you're kind of ahead of things um and so this was born out of my my experience at wired um magazine which i co-founded and edited for the first <clears throat> the first generation and um we'd have our uh, story ideas and we and you know we'd have we get oftentimes we'd work backwards it's maybe more detailed than people want to know but we would uh, we would start with i would start with a cover i would say what would be make the most amazing wired cover mm. okay let's imagine this amazing wired cover and then um what would what would we need to you know so we make up something like oh you know the, the actually the first cloned human already exists all right that would be a cool cover um, so we say like, what's, what's the probability that that's true? Um, and, you know, we would go back and is that all possible? Could, could, could this be, and what would we have to know and so forth? And so maybe it, you know, maybe we decide, okay, that's just not, you know, that's very unlikely, never going to happen. We don't know where it is, but maybe we decide we're going to try and, um, actually send a reporter to investigate. Maybe we have a hunch, maybe we've heard something. So, um, so we'd work back from from a good idea and um so we're pitching ideas all the time and trying to find writers to write stories so we'd have these story ideas and say you know like you know what's happening with uh, the microsoft um uh, monopoly suit or whatever it is and and we would pitch different ideas and often i would be pitching ideas that i'd have and um nobody thought was it nobody thought they were good ideas so it's like you know you're pitching many, many ideas. And so these, these ideas, like oh, that's, so someone said, that's not a good idea or nobody's interested in it or it just doesn't seem feasible or it's boring. Okay, so the idea goes by the wayside. I have other ideas, but maybe what might happen is maybe a year later, I would think, you know, I, I thought that idea from last year, I, is there a really great idea? I think we really should do this. And people would say, no, I don't know. It's not that interesting to me. 
I don't think that's such a good idea or whatever, or no, who's going to do it. And so maybe we try to find writers. No writer wants to, is interested in it or capable of it, whatever. And then it goes away, but then it comes back a third year, the same idea. <laughs> it's like, I really think that's a good idea. Uh, we'll work really hard to try to find a writer for it. And then I would try and find a writer for it. And there was nobody there, no one who wanted it or could do it or whatever. So then I realized, oh, wait, 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 wait. I still think it's a great idea. I can't find anybody. That means that I have to do this idea. I've been trying to give away this idea. I've been trying to hire people to do this idea. But I think it's a really great idea. So, so no one else is going to do this. I can take my time writing mm. this because I've been trying to give it away forever. Um, I'm the only one who thinks, it, and it's very easy in a certain sense for me at that point because it's, it's the thing that only I can do. Right, and um, that usually would turn out to be my best piece. Mm. It was the thing that only I would write, and so I, I so I realized that you know, for most young people, including myself, the holy trinity of career was to find something that you were really good at, um, loved doing, and got paid for it. Mm. Right? I'm just like, that's the Holy Trinity. That's the thing. It's like, okay, you want to be in this little Venn diagram where you have this overlapping thing. You're good at it. You love doing it. And other people find it valuable. Okay, that's it. But but for me, there was a, a fourth circle. There was a fourth one. That once you kind of arrive at that, which you hopefully, and someday, if you're lucky, you will, there is yet another level. And that additional level is, can anybody else do this? Right. So when I'm when I'm approached with an opportunity, it's like, mm, yeah, I would. That'd be fun. I could be really good at that. Mm, there's money in it. But then I say, wait, 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 wait. Could anybody else do this? If someone else can do it, then I'm not going to do it. Mm. Even though it would be fun, it, I'd be good at it and get paid for it because. I, time is short our life is short and i want to be doing the things that only i can do because those are the ones that you know that are going to be my best is the things that only i can do so that's don't be the best be the only mm. and that's beautiful i love that that thought of just finding what makes you uniquely you um and it's it's a very high bar, I have to say. It will take it took me most of my life to um, kind of figure out what it is. I think for most people, it takes it will take most of your life to figure out what it is that you're really good at and unique about. There may be some prodigies that kind of are aware of this very early in life, but that's not the normal thing for most of us. It'll take your life, and your life will be full of detours as you shift and bend and backtrack and that's necessary that th that journey is necessary to try and make sure that you uncover these things because they aren't going to be necessarily obvious for most people what it, what what you your unique combination of gifts are and so that long meandering unstraight journey is the way in which you arrive at to, to that self-knowledge about what it is that you are particularly suited for. That's fantastic. That sounds like the uh, pinnacle of the advice right there. I think so. I think it's, uh, as again, I think that's the aspirational aspect of it that um, we want to, um, uh, you know, as I said somewhere else, like if, if you're kind of the only person doing something, then you don't even need a resume. And, and, and by the way, in this era of AI and people feeling like artists feeling that their style might be stolen by the AI in some kind of way, um, what you really want to aim to be in, with the, uh, in your life is you want to aim to be um something that i ai cannot predict mm. 
all right that 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 is you know the ais today the way they work is that they're basically a wisdom of the crowd kind of thing they're kind of the average the global average of all human behavior and all human insight and they tend to produce things that are kind of middle of the road stuff unless they're oppressed and um if you if you're uh, there's another bit of advice to say, which is if your views on one thing can be predicted from your views on other things, you might want to examine your own um, perspective because that's you may be caught in ideology, right? If 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 your if I if your views on housing can be predicted from your views on uh, you know I don't know police or or, or abortion, then you might be in an ideology what you really want to have is your 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 views on one thing should not necessarily be predicted from your views on another if you were really an independent thinker or if you were really true to yourself because we are complicated people and we know and we know that um the strengths we have are also aligned with the 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 weaknesses if they're on the same axis and so if you are incredibly gifted in one thing you're likely to be struggling with the op the, the thing at the same the very same thing at the other end and so um uh that means that um you know your views should if they're really authentic to you should have that same kind of unevenness should should also not be um uniform in that way and if they right. are uniform if they are uniform it's like well you may just be echoing something rather than really true to yourself that's certainly one of the themes of this podcast is to be careful of getting caught in ideology and dogma um i like how you you uh, describe AI as uh, the average, right? And it seems to me that maybe that is pushing us as a species to go beyond the average, right? And and I think so. So so um, one of the consequences of having these AIs trained, and by the way, I always say plural because they're they're not just one. There's many. There'll be hundreds of them. Um, we're training these AIs on all of human um, behavior and knowledge, which means that it's like, um, yes, uh, obviously, because on average, humans are racist and sexist and mean. Um, of course, the AIs are going to be that because they're just they're just been trained on on this. Even our great literature the greatest noble literature we have talks about people who are flawed and, you know, there's war, there's crime, there's murder, all this stuff. So of course the, the AIs are hearing about all this and that's what they're going to be. Um, they're going to, their behavior is going to be basically the average, but here's the thing. We're not going to accept that. We want the AIs to be better than us. Hmm. <laughs> We're, we're demanding that the AIs not be as racist, sexist, mean as the average person. And so we can give them ethics and morality. It's just code. It's very easy to program in this. The, the problem that we have is that we don't know what better than us looks like. We have no consensus on what a better than us human would do we don't know what that behavior we have no consensus on that behavior on what that is, what that means is that just woke is it something else and so um and so that's that that's the problem the problem is not coding it into the ai we can easily do that and make them behave and have ethics and morality the, the issue is we don't have an agreement in our own personal human ethics and morality are very shallow and very inconsistent and very vague um, but we are not going to accept that with an ai the ais have to be much more and so that's like a this is a huge problem so we're and, and and i would think i think it's like these are like our children and so 
the hope is is that in that process that enables us to become better humans ourselves that's what i was wondering is if by taming the ai yeah. so to speak that would feed back to us and drive us to a next level i that's fascinating yeah and I want to say in your book, The Inevitable, you discuss how AI can provide new and different perspectives. Maybe that's what we're talking about right now. Yeah, we are. Yeah. This idea that, you know, I, I think without AIs, we would never, or we would only very, very slowly try to progress in moral progression and progress. But this is a way of, of, of trying to accelerate our own development as humans. Mm. Um, that we're kind of like, we're being confronted with these children, mind children, and um, we need to train them. And we, like any children, we want our children to be better than us. And so, um, so we're being forced to, to as a society, rather than at the family level, to the society level, to make, to articulate what the goals are, what the aspirations are, and what that looks like and i think a lot of the talk about wokeism is just, is just part of that is it's it's like what is it how, uh, that we you know how, how do we be how do we behave better what does that even look like right and the other side of this to me is that all this technological change is really um disrupting the structures and the status quo so to speak we've been dealing with for so many years and you had some phrases uh, improbable is the new normal and certainty is no longer certain right do you see that um is there advice in your book on how to deal with this with the how super with this super ordinary extraordinary becoming the ordinary um well, just how we as a species, as a, well, or just individual humans, can deal with all the change we're confronted with. Oh, I see. Okay. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, well, I mean, <laughs> one of my pieces of advice is that when you are kind of struggling with a decision um, about what to do, um, favor the decision that induces change. So I'm very pro-change. There should be a word for that. I'm a pro-changeist. <laughs> <Is that? laughs> we need a we need some latin word i don't need any word. <laughs> some pro changes do some uh, work on that yeah and we need a good uh we need a good word but um so so yes i i i think that's how we learn i think that's how we grow so 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 in in the basic fundamental perspective of growth there's change now there can be just change for the sake of change. There can be change without growth, for sure. Mm -hmm. But there can be no change. There can be no growth without change. So I am in favor of the change because it's more likely that we'll have growth around it if we just than if we just have the status quo. And so um, uh, the, the the idea of of too much change is sort of what we're grappling with and um um that is i i don't, I don't know if i have adv advice b b about that um in the book i counsel myself and others that we we're now at the point where there's so many new things that we can't not possibly adopt them all so we are mm. like the amish making choices about what stuff we use and we don't use unlike the amish who do this collectively they they as a group decide what to adopt and not. we do this individually because we're individualistic americans or, or westerners and or you know whatever and um uh so we we are at the point where <clears throat> we cannot do everything so <clears throat> i i think there is a natural um was it limit to the amount of change that we that we uh, that we just do naturally that we we don't we're not going to do tiktok or whatever it is it's just it's just too much and that's fine and, and 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 i think it's 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 natural i i advocate trying as many things as possible but being very very ready to give them up mm. and the reason why you're trying is because 
you should be on your journey to try and find out what it is that you do best. And I think um, there are all these new tools that help people express. So there are there is someone somewhere who's a Shakespeare for TikTok. And they've been waiting all their life for this technology to come along and it'll be just perfect for them and their genius will be released and shared. And it won't just be lip syncing, it'll be something something else. And so, um, uh, so, so we do want to keep trying things to, 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 to see if there is something there for us, but we should be really, really ready and quick to, um, to let it go and, um, not adopt it and not change in, in that dimension. And so I, I would say just observing the people that I know who are at the front of this rapid wing is frontier this this supersonic edge that we're on and observing how they deal with it um i think that's how they deal with this ceaseless relentless change is that they are still being selective about what they actually allow into their lives in a significant way so they'll be dabbling and trying things and then um, ignoring them except the ones that you know seem to resonate with them so i have i i, I haven't personally encountered somebody that i felt was just um suffering from future shock um, which was Alvin Toffler's term for what we're talking about. And right. um, the, you know, maybe you can read psychologically into the culture at this moment and say it's suffering through shock, but I don't see that in the people that I meet who are living on that supersonic edge. And um, so that's my answer is, is that I think we have the ability to ignore things if we feel there's too much. And finding the technology that works for you and, right. and helps you become uniquely you seems right. And then discarding it if not. Exactly. So, so we want to have this thing where you're, you're we're open to new things, but we don't have to necessarily adopt. We also have the confidence to ignore the new thing. And um, that's fine. I'm not on TikTok. Uh, I keep, but, but I go back to it about, you know, once a year to kind of look to say, well, am I missing? What am I missing? Has it changed any? So I might go on to, to TikTok. I was very slow. I, I got an early Twitter account. And for the first, I don't know, eight years, it, it, I didn't need it. It wasn't, useful it was a, it was another thing i didn't need i'm now um a regular poster on twitter and reader so um i, I kept going back and just kind of to make sure that it, that um you know, to see if if it was you know I'll, nfts i'll you know i'll look at them early and they're not working for me but i'll go back just to make sure to see if because it changes and develops and i want to um I want I want to be reading that to see if there's something there for me, and um, I, I think that's I, I, I think other people are doing that too. It's just not me, so that's my observation. Yeah, one thing I'm noticing as you're talking is that I've become increasingly frustrated with Facebook, and maybe it's time for me to to, to depart from that technology. Yeah. It's very easy. It's, I mean, I was just, uh, someone was telling me recently they had this epiphany. He was a young person. He had this epiphany that, that kind of, he said it was, was like a, um, what's the word I want? A, a release um, where he was able to um, discard a book that he started. Mm. He, he was under, he, he kind of grew up in a, in a world where, where you had a commitment. If you started a book, you were obliged to finish it. And it was just like, it was killing him. <laughs> but he had this, he had this new, because he just couldn't, 
read, you know, you can go on to the next book until we finish that one. And so uh, he had this thing where now like he picks up a book and he'll try it. And if it doesn't work, he's like, he's done. And it was like totally freeing. I had the same thing about movies. When I used to go to movies, I was under this idea that you could not walk out on a movie that, that was like insulting mm. to whoever somebody made it. somebody <laughs> that if you were in a movie that you were kind of obliged to give that those artists your time i i have no you know watching things on on the screens i have no compulsion i have no obligation at all right now it's like you know i'll give all you right. 10 seconds and whatever so um yeah so technology is we want to have that same stance um, you know, maybe you go back to a book later on. I tried to read War and Peace a num three times, I think, and I just could not get through it until I listened to it. I audited oh. it, and all of a sudden it just changed. It was all those Russian names and stuff I just could, couldn't get through, but it, it worked being told. And so it was just a fabulous thing. Um, it's kind of three books all buried in, in one. And anyway, the point was that. You can go back. You can keep going back to things that you let go because your situation may change and the, that thing may change over time. So, um, but I think we should be really, really ready to just ditch stuff all the time. Right. Well, I love your last example where you, you moved from reading to listening. Yes. And that, that opened up a whole new avenue yep. for you yep. that made it accessible. Right. And people, and, and right now that is an option. So like, um, people who are really good at reading will, will switch. Sometimes a book that doesn't work audibly needs to be read, particularly nonfiction that you may want to study where you have to back up a little bit to make notes and make notes and stuff. Um, I like my fiction. I like to audit my fiction. So I, 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 I find that I'm much more receptive to spending time with a fictional if I'm being read to it. Hmm. You mentioned future shock a minute ago, and I, maybe this is just my interpretation, but it does seem like our society as a whole is is more and more polarized along ideological lines. And what I noticed, uh, this is a lot of how I think, so I might be just projecting into what your your book is about. But there's a lot about how to relate to other people. Mm -hmm. You mentioned kindness and gratitude earlier, mm -hmm. but even learning from people you disagree with. Right. Um, it seemed like a number of the different entries in your new book uh, had to do with how to relate to other people and how to grow as a person through relating to other people. And I'd, I'd say it's my bias that that's a way to help mend this divide that we're currently in. Yeah, I mean, it's actually the very first piece of advice in this book of 450. It says, learn how to learn from those you disagree with or even offend you see if you can find the truth in what they believe and it goes back to this idea that we're all flawed characters i've had the privilege of meeting and spending time in some cases with some of the most gifted accomplished people in the world some of the most famous people in the world some of the most richest people in the world and um it's very clear that, uh, well, here's how I would say, greatness is overrated uh, <laughs> in a certain <laughs> sense. That, 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 that the more, ex that the greatness is kind of an extreme thing. You, you have to be extreme to be great, to, 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 be, to, to make your way to the minds of a billions of people. You have to be extreme in something. And that extremity comes at the cost of kind of extreme flaws. Mm. Um, okay. So the extremely great and accomplished have extreme flaws at the same time. And so there are people whose opinions uh, or her views or something I totally reject, but there are, and that's their, my eyes, that's their weakness, but they have other corresponding qualities that I can learn from, that I, that I can admire. And, um, and so it's a way of maybe being more empathetic 
mm-hmm. with with people you're you're empathizing with them in order to to learn so you so um uh it's it's hard it's hard because because i'm a, i'll have a natural al- allergy to whatever their may some particular beliefs are that seem to be outgrowth from their personality but there can be other aspects of their personality that are admirable and um have something to to teach me and so being able to to kind of overcome that is not at all easy and 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 i have to say that, that i don't think we're in any obligation to like everybody right we don't have to like everybody so so there are people whose personalities i don't like and i have no obligation to like them i have a certain obligation to respect them as humans to have empathy to their as a person because as i said they're they're compli- they're going to be complicated and they will have good qualities and that deserves my my respect and so it's a way of kind of like learning from people that you don't like which is really hard because if you don't like them you don't like spending time with them so 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 i, I don't think we're un- obliged to have to be around them or learn from them i'm just saying we can and you'll gain a lot if you do but it's not easy because you're going to be revolted by Mm. by their views and it's a but it's a way to try and connect with another human being um, that you might be struggling with sure and i also say that 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 one of the best ways to change people's minds so there's a couple of bits of advice. One is that you can't reason someone out of an opinion that they haven't reasoned themselves into. Most people's beliefs are not about logic. They're they're they're, they're they transcend it. They're 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 deeper. They're emotional. They're they're about deeper needs than logic. So logic arguing with them is not going to undo that. The the most powerful force you have for changing someone's mind is to actually to understand and to listen to their views to try to understand how they think or why they think that that and and that act of empathy of listening actually gives you a little platform to influence them because you're Mm. not at the level of of trying to argue with them or logic you're at the level of empathetically connecting with them and it's that connection that gives you any any position to nudge them in a certain direction. So listening and trying to understand something you disagree with is the only way to have any influence on what they think. And it, that reminds me of maybe another one of those pieces of advice that uh, was something about going three times deep, like yes. and more and more and more. Right, that is that's Esther Perel, right? And the idea is that um, uh, when this is just a bit, you know, basic skill, which is really, really good in particularly marriages and other intimacies. If you, if a person, if you want to, you know, you want to listen. Listen to superpower. So what you do is you 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 ask them to to talk, and when they're done, when they stop. You say, is there more? Can you tell me more? And there's always more. And this time around, though, all the kind of obvious cliches and everything have all been said, and they're going to have to go deeper to continue going. And they will go deeper. And then when they stop, you do the magic thing of asking for a third time, can you tell me more? And now they have to really get down to the the real fundamental reason, and you've helped them get there, and you're open to it. And so it's the moment when they can reveal or say or you know um, express that thing that's hard to say and hard to get to and hard to admit to, and they're vulnerable, and so. <clears throat> that's when you hear the truth. Mm. Powerful. 
Yeah. Maybe helps them unpack their own assumptions yeah. that might be in their way in the points you're disagreeing on or pack unpacks right. your assumptions. Sure. Well, if we can switch gears a little bit, I, I have to ask about crypto. And I know we can talk about crypto without talking about money. And uh, you've mentioned it's just plumbing. Is that um, where you stand on the issue still? So so um, there are a couple of family members who are interested, who are involved in crypto. And my, my, my outstanding um, challenge was... Um, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll talk about crypto, but with one caveat, and that is that we cannot talk about money, making money, saving mm -hmm. money. And as I said, those conversations are very short because until now, crypto has mostly been about money. And I'm pretty bored with money. It's, I mean, money is very complicated and there's a lot to say about it but it's often reduced to a single dimension. And so, um, <clears throat> um, uh, so, I, 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 so, so I, I think, I think my summary of, of crypto is, I think technologically, the idea of blockchain is elegant and sweet and powerful. And I think it does or can enable decentralization of all kinds of things. However, we don't yet have some good examples of where it's been worth the price to pay of, of decentralization. Decentralization is incredibly in inefficient. Mm. Evolution is inefficient. It's like, yeah, you're going to make a million frog eggs and then two survive. <laughs> what that's mm. like, that's really, that's really inefficient. So uh, evolution is not concerned about efficiency, evolution and life and is incredibly inefficient. There's, there's, it's does it work um and over time the inefficiency is valuable so you the 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 the, the price or the cost of having a very adaptive system is that it's very it's inefficient and so we have not yet come upon a task that we want to centralize that we're willing to pay this cost of the inefficiency of these transactions and the inefficiencies are energetic, and they're 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 um, computational. There's complexity. There's there's a lot of things, uh, reasons why, so far, it hasn't worked on any of the tasks that we imagine it for. I think it's possible that it could, but the one thing I would say about it is, it, it, it the 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 crypto has to bring value while it's losing money mm. okay so so right now crypto is only seen valuable if it was making money if the price was rising but it's like this has to be an expense you have to be willing to pay for this mm. rather than seeing it as a profit center as way, the way you're going to make money it's like no if, if it's really valuable you'll be willing to pay for it it'll be an expense and so what the current kind of deflation in, in 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 crypto is good because it squeezes all the money out and if 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 it's losing money and still worth doing that means it's valuable and we haven't seen that yet we haven't seen that um, where the value is independent of its price because let's like if you buy a house well, you hope of course that the market value of the house goes up but even if the market value of the house goes down it's still valuable to it to you it's independent of the actual market value of 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 the house crypto is not like that right now it's like yeah you can say i'm doing something here nfts and they're losing money every day and that's great that's okay because they still have value we haven't quite seen that yet right I appreciate that perspective. It seems really, really early um, for the whole technology, despite it being around for a while. And I thought I'd heard you refer to it as plumbing at some point, and it does seem like we're creating a network on which transactions can take place in a yeah, different I, I, way. I, the other way I would say it is that um, one of the marks of a successful technology is that it becomes invisible, like plumbing. Right. And that, ah. and that you want it to be boring. That if it's exciting, 
it probably hasn't really arrived. Like, right. you know, it's, it's like Google, it's like search. Search, the, you know, internet search. Totally boring right now. Totally <laughs> works. Totally valuable. Right? It's like, because it, you know, it works. So we don't even think about it. So, so this is Danny Hellis's uh, definition of technology. <clears throat> With Alan Kay's definition of technology was anything that was invented after you were born. <laughs> Danny Hellis's uh, riff on that was anything, technology is anything that doesn't quite work yet. Mm. Once it, it works, we don't think of it as technology. So technology in our, is all the things that aren't quite working yet. Crypto. AI, right? Genetic engineering. These are technology because they, they're, they're kind of not working. They're not invisible yet. Mm. That's the Arthur C. Clarke quote: "Any technology sufficiently developed is like magic." Yeah, this is a little different. It's like saying any technology is that sufficiently developed will be invisible. Right. It will be out of mind. We won't even think about it. It'll be boring. It's actually the only the new sophisticated technology that we find magical. Right. And AI, by the way, that's, that was a new uh, op-ed in your Times, Ross, do to go, that would have you say his name, um, talking about how uh, the language around a lot of these AI and chatbots is very magical. And I use the same thing, incantations and spells, mm. which are the prompts. Um, so yes, yeah, so there there is a little bit of a magical sensibility to that right now. Beautiful, Kevin. Is there anything I have not asked you that you'd like to talk about today? Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, um, well, yeah. So so this is little book, uh, um, excellent advice for living, is why I'm kind of um, chatting with people these days. Um, yeah, everybody wants to know about AI. I think AI is in the long, right now I think AI is underhyped for the long run. Oh, wow. Um, I think the I think we're for the next century, we're gonna be talking about AI, but we've also been, also have been talking about it for a century already, which is the first time in history when we have discussed a technology for so long and so deeply before it ever arrived. Mm. But I think what we have right now is a little bit overhyped. Um, the chatbots, um, we're in this really wonderful process. It feels like the 1980s, 1990s, when the internet was coming along, where every day there's this sort of, um, you know, magical sense of like something new happening very, very rapidly. And so the this the going back to your change the, the the rate of change in, in, in this is, is really fabulous and and what's really interesting um is that the people inventing it don't really know what it's going to be used for and that's been the the, the that's been the excitement as these tools kind of are released to see the way that immediately millions of people are grabbing them and then using them and then coming up with new things to do with it that the inventors had never thought of. So, you know, the, 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 the image, the image um, generators were just a little byproduct of, of the, of these experiments to try to do a general intelligence. And they were not seen as, as products or anything initially They And, and they were, and, and the way people are using them were not at all foreseen by the people inventing them. And the same thing were happening with these chats, which people discovering that they can do analytics and they can do analysis in ways that were not at all in people's, the, the minds of the people who were inventing these. And so there's whole new use cases, whole new, um, what's the word I want? Occupations, whole new, mm. whole new products coming out or services coming out that people did not expect and so so there is this sort of you know it's like inventing the internet and just who knew that you could do ebay or uber or whatever it was just they, they were not foreseen 
by any science fiction writer. And um, that's very exciting because it's, you know, day by day, people are discovering, oh, this stuff is really good for this. Who knew? And then other people kind of pile in and they say, oh, yeah, you know, this plus that, but not this. And so there is this very accelerated learning collectively happening. And um, I find it incredibly exciting. Yeah, me too. Give it a try. It's free. The only way we get to steer technologies is by using them. So mm. I, um, um, don't let people ban them or stop them because then we don't get to steer. So um, try try them out. Um, try to make some images for free. Try to, to have chat write a summary for you. You'll be amazed and mm. um, learn learn what works and what doesn't. So have a good journey. Thanks for fabulous. I appreciate your time and your questions. Yeah, thank you. Uh, excellent advice for living. I've got a high school sophomore and a college freshman. They're both going to get a copy and I'll be borrowing it back from them. So thanks for your time, Kevin. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mike. I really appreciate it. Take care. Bye. That concludes the episode. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed it. A big thank you to Kevin Kelly for taking the time to chat and Claudia Dawson for setting up this opportunity. Thank you to Christina Pearson of the Robert Anton Wilson Trust and Richard Ross of Hilaritas Press. Our next regular episode, releasing on the 23rd of May, will feature Falcon Press co-founder Nick Tharcher. Until then, I am your host, Mike Gathers, signing off with love and cheerfulness. Amor e hilaritas.